Now, the one thing I see, uh, people like Trent Reznor have talked about this idea, um, or, or Radiohead, for example, um, putting out you know, box sets and limited editions, selling them out, creating the whole notion of a scarce good, uh, and, and actually building up, you know, turning it into a revenue stream, which is you know, kind of intuitive. You know, the concert is the ultimate scarce good. You know, it only happens in that one time in real, you know, one place in real time. Now, you've sort of turned that, I'm just wondering, you know, playing the devil's advocate here, are we going in a direction where all the mystery is gone? All the scarce goods are in the, on the planet are gonna be gone because everything's on the internet. But, but again, <laughs> I would just go back to what, what we just talked about, which is it's not meant, it doesn't have to replace live, live. It, 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 it's, I don't know anything out there that can replace that intimate live experience that you're with your, your, your friends, your family, you're cheering for someone you love. This is a different kind of experience. And so I, don't, I think it's something different. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna put it in that box, I, I agree with Rio, we're gonna put it in that box, maybe, you're, maybe the answer is, okay, yeah. But if we put it in a completely different box to say, this is actually just whetting your appetite for when, when they travel, they go around to your local market. You got to see them because you saw something in there that I, I got to see it live. It's gonna it's gonna change it and 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 make it something different, and that you're still going to want to have that live experience. Or even if you don't, there's other ways to experience that. And people have been doing that from whenever the mu music started. So that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mystery, you know, like in my eyes, I you know since 91, especially like with the, the age of the grunge movement, like, I mean, once, I, I, I guess that's what Kurt Cobain sort of represented, like, you know, the everyday man. I mean, once the everyday man becomes the star and the poster child, then the mystery is pretty much gone right there. So like the seeds of that, you know, also 91 was the year that the real world came out. So the whole idea of people wanting to feel as though they can be that too, or I can be that star, you know. That that faucet sort of got opened in, I think, in like 91, and has been a, not a down, I want to look at it negative, like, oh, a downward spiral, like, mm -hmm. but the whole idea of mystery and no more interviews and, you know, the, the messages in my music and my lyrics and that's how you'll, you know, that that's pretty much, uh, Gone. I think mystery only benefits those who are like involved in deep scandals when mm -hmm. they're silent. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, the idea of interactivity, the idea of the fans uh, becoming more intimate uh, on all levels, that's a good trend, is what you're saying. You think that's a good thing, the way things are going, Questlove? I think it's fantastic. I, I've actually heard a couple of things here. One, Robert's is, now speaking. It was Facebook. executed. <laughs> it was it was all done in a web native way. Yeah. But it was different, right? It was a lot more unique, and it was that actually enabled consumers and or users to uh, expand their love for that art. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, you know, again when they when they when they see the act, when they see the artist in their hometown, they are that much more likely to either go to see them or purchase records, or whatever it is. But it's the web native, more utility, you know, the more utility that, uh, that Questlove was talking about, you know, different angles. It's just so much more engaging. So consumers are engaging much more with the arts, and it all just depends uh, how you want to consume it and how much more you expose to them. And so I think it's all just expanding the appetites and expanding the experiences. And, and programs like this that if I'm not saying we've got everything perfect, but um, I would say if you do it th the right way with quality um, and, again, creativity, um, and everybody's bought off on um, how everybody's represented and, and it's done the right way, it actually it, it can it can fuel so much more because it, it, it's done so well, opposed to, you know, you've probably seen a lot of stuff on the web that is just not done so well, that it, it's not le legit, and it probably could hurt. So I think when you do it right, um, and you care about the consumer and you want to provide value. Again, I think we, a p bunch of people have said this, which is let's provide value to the consumer. And if we do our jobs right and we're really lucky, um, they'll give us their loyalty and they'll, they'll say that's a brand that it's pretty interesting and that I'm, um, I'm interested in. And that's what I believe. I believe it's, it's not this, then this. It's this, then this, then maybe 10 other things. And we, we just need to do it the right way. We need to provide value and constantly um, remind ourselves of that. Mm -hmm. 
I want to talk a little bit, too, about when we talk about pipelines and music, um, we're, we're talking also about niche. We're talking about depth of passion. I think we're trending away from kind of gunshot type of you know, marketing campaigns where it's aimed at everybody. Everybody's in. Uh, no depth of passion there. Uh, it seems more about focusing on the most dedicated fans and bringing them into the fold for a particular, particular band, particular music, and attaching brands to that. Um, and I know, Robert, you're, you, you've talked a little bit about this already with, with YouTube, but it seems like that's where it's trending. Um, less about scattershot, more about specific demographics that you can reach with, with programming. Um, sure. Um, I think overall the internet is all about niches. The internet is the infinite uh, warehouse of a lot of things, services, goods. And um, you know, YouTube has a lot of content on it. And what we, uh, what we uh, want to do is serve our users better by organizing the content in, in, in ways that are allowing them to pursue their passions. And passions that may not necessarily be served well on TV, or they are as well, and we have additional content. But it's all about the organization around deep passions that we can serve because we have a very large global scale. And the global scale allows you to serve niches very, very well. And um, that's, that's what excites me, me about YouTube because we can deliver on things that people are just incredibly passionate and mm. they sometimes can't feel that passion anywhere else. And, and, and they can do that with us. And we have, we have a long way to go. Um, but you know, companies like Vivo, great example of, of uh, doing that with us. And we just want to expand on those partnerships. There are many other existing partners, you know, Revision 3, Che Carl, you know, whether they're individuals, companies, there are people who, who are organizing content on YouTube essentially, mm -hmm. and, and we just want to feel that effort a lot more. Rio, I want you to talk about, you know, you're dealing with, with Vivo, you're talking about three of the, three of the big labels as, as partners in this. Um, what is being done to sort of reach out, okay, when we come from this video model that MTV had in the 80s and 90s, it was about, by the end of it, it was about you know, million dollar videos made by major label funded artists and very little else ever got aired on MTV. Let's, let's forget about the fact that they stopped airing music videos anyway, you know, after a while. But the point was it became, the pipeline got very narrow. Now you're dealing with some of the same entities with maybe different players at the top. And what, if anything, has changed about the way access, you know, does, it, does, it got, does, does the kid making a homemade video in his bedroom, or you know, that indie rock band have a chance of, you know, getting getting Vivo airplay. I, I think that uh, it's a, it's a good question. The things that have changed um, since the 80s and the 90s is fundamentally uh, people are buying less music, right? So music videos were born in the late 70s as promotional pieces to help raise awareness of the sale of recorded music, right? They were given away for free as promotional videos. Um, in 1999, that was the peak of the recorded music business. And since then, the industry had to figure out how do they uh, diversify uh, what is, where revenue is going to come from. And so music videos became commercial goods, right, in 2004. And all of this is a long way of saying that they're, they're now a premium revenue stream uh, driving revenue back to artists, rights owners, songwriters, et cetera. Um, and, and so there's now a confidence in creating them because you know you're going to get money back as opposed to I'm going to spend money to make a video and I don't know whether it's going to help me sell more music or not and I definitely am not going to make money from this video. Um, now it's I can spend $100,000 to make a video and I, or $10,000 to make a video or $1,000 and I know that there's a mechanism to distribute it where it's going to be seen. There's a mechanism to monetize it, right, where I'm going to generate revenue and I'll generate as much revenue as I can as if the content is good and people like it and they want to watch it and share it, right, then I can generate more awareness and more revenue and that's a totally different dynamic. But the fan, here's what's changing. In the old world, we, we used words like premium and professional, and, uh, and, and big companies and big artists make quality things. But the, real, the way we're moving into is a world where the fan doesn't care what the budget was. The fan doesn't care who owns the copyright. 
the fan doesn't care if it came from Interscope Records or a 16-year-old girl from Tokyo who made a good video for The Roots, right? At the end of the day, the fan just says, hey, is this cool? Do I like it? Do I want to watch it and share it? And they don't care about anything else. So the words professional and premium are generally not words that will have the same meaning <laughs> in the future as they do now or as mm -hmm. they did in the past. So it's up to us as an industry, as a platform, as a partner uh, to evolve with where consumer sentiment is about what they want to watch. So we're focusing right now on what we call ultra premium um, music, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, we're not trying to be the place where everybody can upload every video because that place already exists. It's called YouTube. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and YouTube uh, is moving into the premium end. Um, and we think that, that, that there's enough room for everybody and it's a very big market opportunity. Um, but I think the world is definitely changing and we're seeing um, artists and rights owners and, and brands and fans evolve with these changing times.